Real estate is about freedom, choice freedom, time freedom, and money freedom, and the impact you can make with that freedom. But it doesn't come without cost. Your freedom takes work. That's why Neil Timmons brings together the tools you need to build your real estate legacy, from tips and tricks to interviews with industry titans. It's all here in one place. Real grit. Let's get to it. What if I told you you can make 20 times the return of a single family fix and flip on your next big deal? Well, it's actually possible. It's possible inside the world of commercial real estate. Say, I'm inviting you to this free challenge. It starts August 15th. It's totally free. It's a five-day challenge where I'm going to take you and deep dive into the world of commercial real estate, more specifically, capital multiplier properties, what that is, how we identify them. I'm going to show you how to identify them, how to evaluate them, and how to lock them up risk-free. I'm going to give you all the paperwork to do it. It's totally free. You can sign up to join us at www.20xprofitchallenge.com forward slash real grit. That's www.20xprofitchallenge.com forward slash real grit. And I'll see you in the challenge. Dewan Bent Twyford. Coming right up on today's show, she's going to talk about her 30 plus year career in real estate, really starting as a, a down and out single mom with an eight month old and how she got fired at Denny's on third shift and then stumbled her way into real estate. And now how she's uh, building a, essentially a whole small town, a town that has been forgotten by time. How uh, She's bought multiple buildings in the town and how she's bringing it back to life. She's done just about everything you can imagine in real estate and a tremendous success. A wonderful conversation coming right up with Dwan. Hey everybody, welcome to Real Grit. I've got Dwan Bent Twyford here, and I'm excited that she's here today. She is bubbly. She's full of personality. You're going to be in for a ride today. Dwan, how are you? I'm so good, Neil. Thanks for having me on your show today. Thanks for being here. I, I appreciate it. Say, so we all started someplace. How in the world did you get started in real estate? Uh, you know, it's funny because uh, most people that I mean, that I meet, they're looking specifically to be a real estate investor. And I was, um, so I'm 63 right now. So in like 1980, I was 21, the whole 80s, I was like a wild, crazy woman. And then when I was 30, I was married, I had a baby, going to be a stay-at-home mom. Like, that was my plan. Yeah. And then when my daughter was eight months old, um, her dad and I had a really unexpected split. So now I'm 30 years old. I partied for my whole 20s. I have an eight-month-old baby. I have no money, no car, no education. I've been working in the bar business, and I I had nothing. Now I had no nothing. So... I was looking for something I could do from home and raise my daughter. And so back in like 1990, everything was MLMs. And, you know, so I tried a couple of things. I was like, I need something I can like make money with. And I met some people that were real estate investors. And they said, we buy houses and we fix them up and we sell them. Now, I have no experience. I know nothing. I don't know anything. So my mind hears, we buy houses and we decorate and then we sell them. And I thought, oh. I can decorate. How hard can that be? I'm an excellent decorator. I have great taste. I'll decorate these houses. I'll make money. This will be the best thing in the whole world. Yeah. So I found a house. I moved into it. I did decorate it. And then I realized it needed a ton of work. So I rehabbed it, went to Home Depot, took classes, made 22 grand on my first deal. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I got $22,000. Yeah. And I was in the house and I, I did the rehab, which I liked. And my daughter was with me every day. And I was like, that's it. So. 33 years later, still doing it. Still doing it. Yeah. It, and over, the, over the course of 33 years, I mean, your business has morphed. Uh, you, you just oh. don't do um, houses anymore. You do a multitude of things. So so many. So I, I still do houses. I, yeah. I work with my daughter and my daughter-in-law's sister. So we still flip, you know, 10, 15 houses a year. And we own uh, 20 commercial buildings. We took, there's a little town called Clinton, Iowa, where my husband's from. And we kept going back to all these reunions. I said, man, this little downtown, like this little town needs some love. So we talked to the downtown people and found out there's a big opportunity zone, uh, rebeautification. So in the last couple of years, we bought 20 commercial buildings in this little town. So we're like bringing back a downtown, <laughs> which what? I'm like, I would, I would never imagine that be something that I would actually do. And, and, and it's going great. 
and we have storage units and we rehab and we own rentals and it's just turned into all the things you can imagine. All right. You ready for this? What you don't know until right now is I'm, I'm from Des Moines, Iowa. That's where I am right now. And I know exactly where Clinton, Iowa is. <laughs> okay. Next time I'm in Clinton, you got to come over and have yeah. lunch with us. Yes. I would love that. No, it's wonderful. Yeah, the, little downtown, the little downtown's doing good. Yeah. And since we bought the buildings, the property values downtown, uh, the buildings have gone up 40% already. Yeah. And you know, Clinton, it's like all boarded up. It looks mm -hmm. like time just left it standing there. Yep. And we have really been uh, a big force in bringing it. So it would be like uh, LeClaire yep. or um, Galena, I think. You know, we're trying to make it like that. Galena is a hot spot. Um, oh, my God. Yeah. Every time I go there, I lose my mind. It's like there's so much stuff to buy. Yeah, there is. It is. Uh, it's a fun little town. We get there every every so often. It's great. Well, All see, right. So Clinton tell me. We'll yeah. be like that. And you can say, oh, I knew her before uh, Clinton was that. Before Clinton was Clinton. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, tell me, Um, let's go down that rabbit hole. What What is the unique challenges associated with buying? I'm going to call it buying a town for lack of a better word, uh, buying a town and then coming in and remodeling. You know, you're in a you're in a small um, let's call it a boutique town. That's where you're turning this into, right? Yeah. And I can yeah. imagine contractors are not very plentiful. So talk to me about the challenges and uh, the challenges and then how you, how have you overcome them? So, um, so my husband and my son are like crazy rehabbers. They, they just like live to build things, you know, bring things back and just all the things. So we started off with that. We'll just buy a building. So we bought the Volkman. It's on the corner. We bought the Volkman built. Then we put an antique mall in there. Mm -hmm. And so we opened a business. It was super booming. And then uh, <laughs> the person that we bought it from was an older person who told one of her other like little old lady friends. And they called and said, hey, I've got a building next to that one. I'm 88 or 85. My husband's been dead for a decade. Do you guys want that building? So we're like, Sure. We'll take that building. So it's the Tucker. It's a whole city block. Yeah. And then she told one of her friends and she says, hey, I have three buildings. <laughs> so, so one by one no over ball. the course of like two years, all these little old ladies that meet for lunch called us and we bought up all these buildings. Yeah. So some of them are just sitting because we just haven't had the time to actually get to them. Yep. But we... um Met with the city. Of course, we met with the mayor, met with all the people, said, hey, here's what we want to do. And because of the amount of buildings that we own, when the when the downtown has uh, voting for anything, we hold the majority of the vote now. So <laughs> anything we want, we're like, oh, you yeah. know what? We're going to vote that in. We This is what we want. He so we policy, voted yeah. in more money, more grants, more uh, events downtown. We just vote everything in. So I think we kind of like bowled over the downtown. <laughs> uh, uh, so some it. of the people there are not really big fans are like, you guys did too much stuff. It's like, hey, you guys want this town to grow. It's been sitting here for like, I've been coming here for 20 years. This has been sitting here. Correct. We're going to make sure it happen. Yeah, no, that's great. Talk to me about um, self-storage units. How long have you been in that in that business? Just a little while. We bought some in Clinton. There was a giant self-storage unit and it was, it was actually two blocks away and it was sitting there forever. So the bank called and said, hey, I hear you guys are buying buildings. Yeah. Do you want to have this? It's a storage unit with a, a giant building that like you could, they used to work on semi trucks and stuff like that. Yeah. And we're like, oh, no, you know, it's not downtown and we don't need any more buildings. So they, <laughs> we had a meeting and we decided to extend the downtown like two blocks over. Okay. So, it would, yeah. so it would be in the downtown and it would oh, be yeah. in the opportunity zone. Yeah. Like, okay, we'll take that building too. So it's only, it's a small one. It's only got 20 storage units in it, but we, we got it all fixed up, got them all rented, got the big building rented. But here in Colorado, where we live right now, we just bought 17 acres over here and we're going to build like a big storage unit thing all mm -hmm. over the whole 17 acres. So I'm in the process of getting uh, the planning and all the things I've signed off on. So that would be my first like giant storage unit project. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I, I think I know. I know how to build. I know how to rent stuff. I know how to do all that. But uh, that big one, that would be my first big, big project. What's uh, looking back over your career, what's been the scariest thing you've ever done? The most challenging thing? All of it. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because I think a lot of people, they they don't do it because they're afraid. 
And I didn't know anything about real estate investing. So I didn't have any preconceived, I can't do this, I can't do that. What if this doesn't work? What that I didn't know. I honestly thought it was decorating, like legitimately. So I think being so naive at that point was my biggest asset because if I had known I was going to live in a house, rehab a house, I would be like, I don't know how to do any of that stuff. I I can't, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So I started off from a place of, I need to make this work so I can raise my daughter. And I didn't have the fear I think a lot of people have because I didn't know enough. The internet wasn't there. So there was no terrible things on the news. And honestly, back in the day in South Florida, um, there were not many investors. A, a RIA group, the first RIA group in the state of Florida opened up down there in South Florida. And one of my biggest issues back then was it was just all men. Mm -hmm. And then I was like trying to like get into the boys club and nobody took me serious. Nobody took me serious. And within like three years, I was doing 10 times more business than all of them put together. Mm -hmm. And then like I was everybody's best friend. So I think initially it was just like getting into like the club where I could, you know, meet more people, talk to more people, learn more things from other people. And then I don't know. I I just stumbled into all of it. I started doing short sales in the 90s and short sales weren't even a thing. So I trademarked the term short sales as it applies to real estate investing. So everything I've done, it's been like a new thing. But I liked everything and I went into everything. I just always assume I'm going to be successful. And so I, I can't say I've had like a big, horrible hurdle overcome because to me, it was like, oh, this is the next logical step. Yeah. If anything, the biggest thing is the fact I'm sitting on 20 buildings. <laughs> like, Talk to me about uh, the next logical step outside of a single family real estate. What was the next purchase? Rentals. Rentals. So, yep. so rentals, and I will tell you, rentals really threw me out for a loop because I didn't know anything about being a landlord. I had not taken any kind of a class or a seminar or a workshop. And I had my first couple of rentals and the tenants knew I was the owner. They called me, Miss Dwan, you know, I can't pay the rent. Can you let me pay late? Can can you waive the fee? And the else I was like, oh my God. So I, I bought five rentals. And within like two years, I sold them all because I thought I hate being a landlord. And then I went actually and took someone else's class to learn about being a landlord. And I thought, well, no wonder I hate it. I do everything wrong. They have my phone. They call me whenever they want. They, you know, they pay late. They're my friend. And can I let this go and that go and that go? And the second time I came in, I was like, hey, I just managed the property. The owner, she's a witch. And if I even go ask her for something, I'll lose my job. And no one ever knew I owned anything after that. So mm -hmm. I loved it. Yeah. So rentals was my my next step. So single families, rehabbing. Then I started wholesaling because I had discovered wholesaling, which was a lot easier than rehabbing. Yep. And then I started buying rentals. And I did that for like 20 years. And then we started with the commercial and rehabbing up here in the mountains. I married Bill, moved to the mountains. We started doing these big, giant like million dollar rehabs up here in the mountains, which that was fun. I had never done that either. Then we started buying the building. So everything just kind of progressed. I don't know what we're going to do from the building. I guess once they're all done, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do after that. For you, are those buildings primarily um, for businesses? You've got the one business that you said, the the antique business, but or, or is the intent to lease the buildings out? Yes. I actually started three businesses. So <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't like retail, but the antique store, it just, the town needed that. And, 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 you know, antique, I love antique stores. So we start opening an antique store. And then with one of the other buildings, there's two adjacent buildings. We just put a hole in the wall and made it one big space. Yep. I put in a coffee shop and suites and a clothing boutique. But the intent is to rent all of the buildings out. I don't want to own a bunch of businesses. But it kind of made sense to do those and the city gave us the money and, you know, to try to get people coming downtown. Yep. And uh, one building is three stories. So it's commercial downstairs. It's residential upstairs. It's businesses, offices upstairs. Mm. So that one's pretty much pr completely rented now. So I've learned a lot more about doing commercial leases. You know, I've got all these people on all these commercial leases. So it's been a growing, it's been, you know, obviously it's been a growing curve. It's been super fun. And if I don't know anything at this point, I know so many people like you and speakers, I just call up and say, hey, listen, what do I need to know to do this? And what paperwork do I need? And can you just give me like the five minute speech? Yeah. <laughs> and then I go do it. Yeah. <laughs> 
You are an action taker. I'll give you that. Oh, I am. I am. We, my husband and I both, we're just, I don't know. Sometimes I'm just like, we are so crazy. Some, we're, we're sitting around one day and I thought, who is sitting here saying, hey, I just bought a whole town. I'm like, you know, what do we think we should do with that? I'm like, there's no fear of not making it or failure. Or it's like, nah, we'll be fine. We'll turn the whole town around. What, uh, <laughs> thinking back to the beginning of your career, what would you have done differently knowing what you now know? Well, I would not have, I would not have rehabbed straight out of the mm, gate. Yeah. I, I would not because I did not know anything about fixing things. I, I honestly, like from the depths of my soul, thought I was going to move into this house, paint it, carpet it. I had custom made blinds. I decorated it and it needed everything. It needed kitchens, bathrooms, tile. It needed everything. Mm -hmm. And having, and I did it all on credit cards. So at one point, and this is like 1990, I'm like $50,000 in credit card debt, which is an astronomical amount of money yeah. at that time. Yeah. So I think in hindsight, I would not have just jumped into rehabbing without knowing how to fix. I didn't even know how to paint. I didn't know how to do anything. So as soon as I discovered wholesaling, which was about three years in, I wholesaled for a decade. I wholesaled 2,000 houses. Wow. I was just like, eh, because I could wholesale them in, you know, 10 minutes and rehabbing is like, you know, it's a two month deal. Right. And so I, if I, and I tell people that now when I, when I teach, I say, hey, listen, I've done all the things I would have wholesaled first if I had known what wholesaling was. Because yep. it's the easiest way to make money. There's not very much risk. If the deal falls apart, you lose a, you know, small deposit mm -hmm. and you don't have to know how to do stuff. So I, I had I had no idea, but I liked rehabbing because, yeah. and I always tell people, if you ever go through a nasty divorce, rehab a house. Don't go to therapy, rehab a house. Because I was in there and I have this ledger, I'm ripping out cabinets, I'm yep. tearing down walls. I'm like taking all my aggression on this house. And then when it was done, it was beautiful. And then I made 20 grand. I was like, that was the best therapy ever. <laughs> I was so mad at my ex. I was so mad. Yeah. Like, how could you do it? That baby's eight months old. So I thought, man, no, that that rehabbing really helped my soul. It's, it's <laughs> the th therapy you get paid to do, huh? It was a, at my second rehab. I made fifty grand on the second house. That's like nineteen ninety nine one, and I was like, oh my god, I don't even know a person that makes that much money. Like my dad back in that day probably made twenty thousand a year or something. I don't know what the wages were back then, yeah. but and I was like, oh my god, I have fifty thousand dollars in the bank. Like, how is this even possible? So I was so stunned by the amount of money and i really liked rehabbing so i did it for a while like i said and i discovered yep. wholesaling i thought oh i can just flip houses and make money yeah, this is yeah. easier so i went easy for a while then i started with rentals and now we do all of it yeah what's your team what what do, what do everybody surrounds you what does that look like i'll call it your team makeup well, I have a VA team that does 90% of every single thing that needs to be done. Like even like booking something like this. I have a whole VA team that yeah. does all. And then um, I work with my daughter and daughter-in-law, sister. Uh, and they're out there, you know, finding the deals, doing the door knocking, getting things on a contract, doing the wholesaling and stuff like that. And then when I want to rehab, uh, my husband and my son, and we have four or five people that work with us. We have a little a little team of like a tile guy, a carpet guy, a heat yeah. guy. And they they work with all kinds of other people too. So when I am rehabbing, I just like, hey, I need Ralph. I need this guy, that guy. And, you know, we do we do that. So, but downtown, uh, we just have a few different guys that like, this is a roof guy. This is like a handyman, jack of all trade guy. This is a guy, this is a guy. So I'm also just running it all around and getting organized. Yeah. It's well, a lot of... Babysit. But I let my husband do that because he likes it. I'm like, that's your building right there. Let me know when it's done. I'll tell you what it should look like. Here's what we'll do. And then call me when you're done. <laughs> I'm curious, the, the business that you have, these are remote businesses for you. How, how do you operate those? Who runs them? What does that look like? Well, we have um, like a property manager and a, um, like a basically a handyman type of a person in mm -hmm. Iowa yeah. that are full-time employees that live there. Yeah. So we have like boots on the ground. And anything we do up here in Colorado, yeah. you know, we general contract our own yeah. thing yeah. if we're doing anything up here. But the uh, the, the Iowa stuff, the coffee shop, how, who operates that? The actual business. <laughs> so I hire uh, managers. So I hire girls. I, I get them off of Indeed, actually. 
I go in Indeed, I hire yeah. people, I check all the references, I make sure they're good, and I put them in my store and I make them managers. Okay. So, and that's something I never thought I would ever do. But in COVID, everything was shutting down, yeah. but there was money for us to start businesses. And I thought, well, you know, they didn't close antique stores, they didn't close coffee shops, they didn't close little things like that. Mm -hmm. So I actually opened all those businesses in COVID. Okay. And I've got three really great managers and they, I don't even know. I'm like, I don't even know how the hell I got myself into retail. <laughs> but like the, like the antique store, we have uh, like a hundred vendors. So they pay rent mm -hmm. and we get a commission off their sales. Got it. So we don't have to supply the items. We just supply the building and the person that runs I, it. I have been exposed to that business model several times and I yeah. absolutely love that business model. And that's you're, thing, you're, the you're in the you're in the real estate business with, with the quasi retail, right? Yeah. So I, so the antique mall, we don't have, and not one item. We don't go yeah. get items. I have a hundred yeah. vendors all under contract. And then yeah. at the boutique, we have like 20 vendors and the coffee shop, other than making the coffee, we, it's full of vendors too for pies and cookies. And so it's basically, I just take the spaces and rent them out to a bunch of people and have I one person that. that oversees it. So we don't ever have to be there. I knew there was a, that's what I asked the question because I knew that had to be an easier answer than what I had envisioned in my mind about you somehow supplying all these things. No, right. There's yeah. no way. It's like, especially yeah, no, I know. That's why I you know, asked. My husband yeah, and yeah. I do like to go antiquing. So yes. sometimes we'll take off for three or four days yeah. and drive to Iowa and we'll antique along the way yep. and take stuff and put it in the shop. But we haven't put an item in that shop for two years. Yeah. It's all vendors. Yeah. So they all, you know, they're all, and they all like want to have a place to display their items like a 10 foot by 10 foot, yep. but they can't open a full store. Correct. But they're like, they love it. So we have junk or glassware or plastic shelves. Like it's a fancy, it's a fancy, wonderful kind of antique mall. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Fancy, fancy. So yeah, so I just take the concept of renting and all three stores, between all three stores, we have like 150 vendors. And it's, it's great. I update, me, I update yeah. their contracts once a year. In the meantime, I got girls that manage it and yeah. cut them their checks and pay the bills. Good to go. What's, uh, what habit do you attribute to your success? What single habit do you put the most weight on that's attributed largely to your success? Um, honestly, I just always like to grow. I think growing. I, I didn't want to rehab for my life. I didn't want to wholesale every day till the day I'm dead. I didn't want to have stores every day. I don't want to teach seminars every day till I'm dead. So my success is I want to grow into like the next phase of of what's new for me like mm -hmm. owning buildings was new for me so it's like oh my god we're doing a whole town so when the whole town's done we'll probably find another one do you get bored easily um yes i think bill and i are both a little bit like ocd yeah. so we have to have like 25 things going on all the time or we're just like what are we doing today <laughs> so, how do you how do you relax um, well, I go to Florida quite a bit. We have a house in Florida. Yeah. I go to Florida a lot and I go to Florida like five times a year and I ride my bike to the beach and I paddleboard and yeah. Bill and I travel a lot. And when I go speak somewhere, anywhere, we stay in town for like two extra days or whatever, like the thing in that town is, we go do the touristy thing, eat the food, do the thing. Yeah. And I do go to Florida a lot. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. I feel relaxed when I'm doing stuff. When doing stuff, active, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's great. When and you I look, have nothing going on, I'm like, oh my god. Then I'm like, I'm so bored. What should we do? Yeah. So with the whole town thing, it's kind of fun because there's just always something happening. Yes. Yeah, but so we cool. do relax. We do. I, I'm not a workaholic. Bill's not a workaholic. We take time for each other. We have dates. We travel alone. We travel with our kids. Now we have four grandkids. So like, that's my new thing. Yeah. Like, oh my God, my grandkids. I just keep them. I take them everywhere. My grand, my oldest one, she's traveled 35 times with me. Really? Wow. Just seven. <laughs> I take her everywhere. It's like, Hey, Mimi's going, you want to go pack a bag? And she's ready to go in five minutes. I love it. That's so great. <laughs> so. Tell me when you look forward to next year, you and I are recording this on the 30th of December. So when you look yes. forward to 2023, What's it look like for you? Where are you headed? 
Well, I think 2023 will be mostly a time of really just spending some time in Iowa. Um, my my husband, I know you don't know this, and and he just went through a bone marrow transplant. Mm. He has some crazy rare cancer. And so for this whole last year, we have lived very isolated. He's been going through this chemo, yeah. this entire bone marrow transplant, and he's still will be recovering from that probably till the summer. Okay. So so all of 22 and all the way till the summer, he can't fly or be around people or right. we don't even eat out at restaurants right now. Yeah. So I think that's why we're so busy with everything else because it's like we're like housebound, yeah. um, which is fine because, you know, he's alive and he's healthy and he's amazing and, and it's amazing. Um, so I think 2023 will be more of us just getting back into working on our buildings, finishing all the plans that we have drawn and made and and getting because a lot of stuff we just like shut it down so it's like listen i can't oversee anything at all i'm gonna all these buildings we're just gonna lock them up and winterize up and we'll come back yeah and so 2023 will just be like rediscovering and getting out and doing things again because we haven't done nothing this all started in january of last year wow so we lived he lived in the hospital for a while then we lived by the hospital and we just got back to our house just two months ago. Wow. So we've had a lot. So I've had a lot of free time in the house, which is why I'm like, I'm yes. podcasting like a crazy woman. I'm updating my programs because I'm in the house a lot. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Tell us about uh, you host a podcast and and mm -hmm. you obviously do some education and some speaking. So tell us a little about that. So my podcast, so my name is Dwan, and I call my uh, website, my it's the, it's the, the world of uh, the Dwanderful. So I took Dwan and Wonderful and I made a new word and everything is Dwanderful. So my podcast is called the most Dwanderful real estate podcast ever. And I've been, this is, I'm going into my fourth year. So I, I do yeah. 10 shows a month. Um, four of them, I interview people. And on the other six, I, I just teach people. And I do a lot of webinars. I go do a lot of national speaking because I'm really, I'm really big on teaching people because in my heart, I was like a super broke single mom. I had actually been fired from Denny's. Like that was one of my last jobs. I'm like, oh my God, who gets fired from Denny's on third shift no less? I worked third shift, Neil. I got fired at like 345 in the morning. So because I did it as a broke single mom, I really had no education. I I, these people said we buy houses, we fix them up, we sell them. I thought I was truly rehabbing or decorating and I was rehabbing. So even back when I was only four or five years into it, I would do like little tiny workshops at my house because I thought, listen, there's millions of people in foreclosure and there's not enough investors to take care of all of them. And if I can do it, like literally any single person in the world can do it. So I am really big on educating and teaching and training new investors how to do things the right way and run a really ethical business and really put the homeowners first. And, you know, if you do the homeowners first, the money will come. Mm -hmm. And so the last, uh, and I've written four bestsellers. I've written a bunch of books mm -hmm. and not self-published books, like real book deals. So I've written a bunch of books and, you know, now I guess that's not a bunch. I meet people that have written 20 books already. I'm like, okay, I have four, but mm -hmm. So I have four. So I'm excited. And um, so I, I started getting really super into educating in the last 20 years because I see all these and, you know, you know this now with the Internet being like it is. You see all these people online that are selling these magic pills and buy my program and you can print checks while you're sleeping. And but that's not really how it works. Right. And so I and I know if you're new and you look at all the shiny objects, it's hard to know who to trust. So I tell people, listen, I've been doing it for 30 years. So I've been doing it for 30 years. I'm a good person. I'm a good place to start because I'm still doing it. I didn't just pop up out of the woodwork after the pandemic. Like, hey, here's a program. Here's yeah. a COVID program. That's like. Right. So, well, uh, talk to me about what you what you primarily teach on. Well, um, so uh, on some of my webinars, I have a wholesale program. Flip your way to a fortune. I have a short sale program, short sale secrets, and I'm the queen of short sales. I have a subject two. So that's like my main three. Like if you're new, wholesale, short sale, subject two, easy stuff. But then we have what's called an apprentice training where people really come in like for two years with us and we'll help them with any anything that they want. If they want to do notes, they want to do subject twos, they want to 
build from scratch. They want to buy land. Like they're really anything that they want. I will, those people, I handhold them and we like kind of build them a outline and mm-hmm. what they want to yeah. do. And we help yeah. them reach that goal. Sub twos are going to be huge next year. Don't you think? Oh my gosh. They're so huge. We just got yeah. a couple of this. I had just, just, just met a guy. I got five just yesterday. I'm going to get them all on contract this week. Mm-hmm. And this guy's just like, I just, I just need out. Just, you can have them. I don't want even want any money. I'm like, done. <laughs> so I'm actually drawing up the papers right now to get five. And I was like, I'll take these all day. Right. Yeah. Subject twos are really going to be big this year because be the huge. one thing I did find out, because you know, I wasn't able to be out for a whole year because Bill and I were like living in what's called special housing. <laughs> so I started in the fall, just kind of going out door knocking with ale inflation and just talking to homeowners again, like actually talking to homeowners. Yeah. And and the problem is everybody did the forbearance agreements. And now they want the bank to put all the payments on the back, and the banks are like, no. We're not putting all the payments on the back. So the average person I'm meeting right now is like 29, 27, 30 payments behind. And the right. banks are like, no, we're not doing it. So they're like, deed, they want to deed me their house. I was like, yeah, right. but I don't want to pay 60 grand to bring the payments card. Current. So <laughs> yeah. let's, let's work something down with the bank and then I'll take it over. But um, every single person I've got right now is at least a year and a half to two years behind on payments. Wow. So they're just walking away like here take my house i yep. don't care just take it yep. i just i just have to go yep it's gonna look 23 is gonna look a lot different on the house side than 22 it right? is so mm-hmm. different and the other mm-hmm. thing is like even with the interest rates going up like here in denver the property values have fallen a lot correct i mean like a, a surprising amount in just a six-month period yeah yeah and yeah. so yeah. i've got four sub five subject twos and we just submitted a short sale today and the bank's like no we'll do a short sale we don't care we don't want it back I don't want them to file bankruptcy. We'll post on the sale date. We'll just make me an offer and you can have it. Yeah. Like, okay. So we got that going on right now. And then um, I've got one right here in Bailey. I've got five people right here in Bailey. They're like, you can just, after, just give me till January to get through the holidays and you can have my house. I'm like, oh. so people are like handing them to me. So subject two, they're really going to be big, big, yeah, big, big. Yes. Yeah. I totally agree with you there. Uh, let's do this. I want to move on in the final segment, what I call, Four for impact. So okay. your your favorite quote: "The truth is in the red letters." Yeah. Now you're gonna have to expand on that one for us. So that's my sign off when I in my podcast. I always say, "Remember that the truth is in the red letters." So I am a Christian, and if you read the Bible, everything that Jesus said is in the red letters, and everything that's in there is about how to be a good person, run a good business, how to treat people like finances finances are actually the number one topic in the bible more than anything else is talked about money and so i do a little two of my podcasts a month are called business by the book so i Hmm. i do like a bible study but i teach about like about money you know and so um i did and people ask me what that mean i'm like well you know i'm a christian and that's what jesus said and i feel like that is the truth and even if you don't believe in jesus it's a really good way to live anyway so open up a Bible, read everything in the red letters, and you'll feel different about life. Yeah. What do you think holds most investors back from hitting their personal next level? Always fear. Always fear. Yeah. How does how does somebody I, I, get how does how do they get over that? You you sound like you you haven't experienced much of that to begin with, but how does somebody get over that fear? I honestly, you know, Neil, I, and that's not when I, every time I do a, a a workshop at any kind of real estate uh, rear group, I always say to people, like, tell me the one thing that's holding you back. And they, and out of all the people that put their hands up, they all say fear. They're afraid yeah. of what to say, what to do, blah, 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 blah. And so I just tell people, listen, if you have someone or a program or a system or someone who could at least show you something that's been working for 30 years, would that help you on your, on your fear level? And so it does. And like listening to a show like yours and listening to a show like mine and mm-hmm. listening to shows, it helps people, uh, I think, hear from regular people that have done it and gone through it. And I think that helps a lot with the fear factor. They're just afraid of the unknown. Yeah. Outside of real estate, what are you most passionate about? Oh my gosh, outside real estate. I don't know. I'm like one of these crazy, like people that likes to help everybody. Yeah. I try to help like everyone. I mean, people, kids, the homeless. Yeah. Um, just I'm a big, what can I do to help the world? I work with the homeless people. I I just I try to give everybody a better life. Yeah. 
What's your favorite that, way? That makes me happy. Yeah, yeah. It completes you, right? Fulfills you. Yeah, it does. And my grandchildren, I'm like insane with my grandchildren right now. They call me Mimi and we put on glitter and makeup and we do. And I'm just like, oh, my God, my grandchildren, like my heart. I just, I got, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. What's your favorite way to make an impact in the community? And the real estate investing community? Sure. Well, yeah, let's define it that way. You bet. Okay. Uh, my biggest way to make an impact, I think, would be to give people hope and courage and help them overcome and realize that uh, their fear is I, I do fear and fear is an acronym. I do it as false evidence appearing real. Mm. So they're afraid of this, but if they did it one time, they realize like that was not such a big deal. I don't Correct. know why I was so afraid of that. So I think my biggest impact is I'm really good. I'm a good motivator. I edify people. I help them overcome their fears. I explain what's the very worst possible thing that could happen. And if you can live with that, you need to move forward. Yeah. Um. For people who want to find you, they want to follow you, they want to connect with you, they want to go figure, find out, find the podcast, what can they do? Where should they go? Well, they can go to dwanderful.com and they can opt in and they'll get a free ebook and they'll get, uh, I have a program called the top seven real estate investing strategies for today's new market. And I give them that. It's 200 pages. It's really good. And they get an ebook. They can get on, they can just Google Dwanderful and like 2,000 pages will pop up. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. We'll make, <laughs> I'll make sure we get the, the links in the show notes below here. And I'm on uh, Instagram, obviously, Dwanderful, Facebook, Dwanderful. And I'm on TikTok as Dwantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm fantastic too. So if only you had a little more personality, Juan. <laughs> <laughs> I have so much fun with TikTok. I think it, TikTok is like my new weird upside. I know it's like yeah. a terrible waste of time, but my God, there's so many funny things on there. I just I can't stand it. It's great. Well, you, uh, I love the color of your hair, and for everybody who's listening to us on the podcast, Thank you, you should go to YouTube. Just so you can see, uh, I love Dwan's hair. And then your your background, your setup, you get the pink flamingos. Those these are my, migrated these are from Daisy Florida. Daisy May and yeah. Delilah. Okay. These are Daisy May, Delilah, and Dwan. These are my girls. Yeah. Uh, also, I do have a YouTube channel. They just type in Dwanderful Real Estate. I have a YouTube channel. And it's got just a ton of little short one-minute videos. There's just a bunch of them. And uh, and they're all good. I mean, I, I don't know. I think they're good. I, I'm, I'm really big on making things really simple for people to understand and talking like in like regular, you know, not using all the fancy lingo because people don't know what that is. Correct. Yeah. I'll make sure we get that, that link below in the show notes as well. Dwan, I I appreciate that taking the time to connect up here. You've got a wonderful story about literally, I mean, single mom down and out fired from from Denny's on on third shift. Unbelievable. I tell people I went from Denny's to diamonds. I love it. And then, and then, uh, you and I will connect because I, I will, I will make the journey to over, um, over to Clinton, and we'll, uh, I'd love to see. Yeah, we'll what be you're going. Doing we won't be able to go back till the summer, so we'll probably be going back around July, yeah. and uh, and we'll stay for a few months because you know we haven't been there for a while. So you have to come over. We'll have to have lunch. I'll have to get some coffee out of my coffee shop. Yes. You got a wife or girlfriend? Bring them over. I'll. Send them in my boutique and let them go shopping. My wife would, would love that. That would be wonderful. No, we'll do it. Now I'll shoot a video and then I'll follow up with everybody who's listening. We'll post that video too. That'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, I... then we can do like a couple yeah. little quick videos yes, together. Yes, yes. Like here we are in Iowa. Look what it's, we're doing. It's perfect. Uh, almost, uh, I think my average... Most people don't even know where Iowa is. So I love it, the fact that you uh, not only know where it is, but you're actually doing stuff here. So it'd be cool to connect. Yeah. Well, when Bill and I, you know, we go to our high school reunions. His high school is like, man, they are solid. They have one every five years. I mean, like 200 people. They're huge. I'm like, wow, my yeah. high school has one every 10 years and like 30 people come. Yeah. And we went and I kept looking at these little towns. Like, God, this town's so cute. But, yeah. you know, they they moved everything like out. The casino and the Walmart and yeah. everyone went out there and like left the downtown just sitting there. Correct. But it really is so cute. Yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing it. And now that we're in control of it, a lot of good stuff is happening. <laughs> it's all it's all happy now. Imagine that when you get the votes, all the things are going the right direction. Well, you know, just real quick. So we didn't have quite enough votes and people kept voting us down on stuff all the time. Because, you know, we want to do like, we're doing these big concerts in the summer, like where they block off the street yeah. every Thursday, music on the avenue. So I called the girl. I said, listen, I got voted down like the last five things I wanted to do. How do I... How do I get? And she's, well, you just have to buy like if you could get five more parcels, you could control the vote. I was like, okay. So I literally 
bought five more things. And then the next time I was like, okay, so here's what we're doing. So I just, I just pulled like a gangster move on everybody downtown <laughs> and bought more stuff so I could control the vote. <laughs> It's, it's, uh, <laughs> you've got a whole case study there. So I'm you, like, OG oh, deep inside. Like, hey, don't be screwing with me. Don't be telling me no. I'll just buy more shit. I'll, just buy and more I'll shit. tell you what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was so mad. I was like, listen, I'm sorry. I've got big dreams and big ideas, and y'all are in my way. You want what's you do know the golden rule, right? Yes. He who, who has, has he who has the gold makes the rules, right? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But you know what the downtown is like? It's really coming along, and and that's what everybody wants, but nobody yeah, wants absolutely. to step up and do it. So I'm yeah. like, I'll take control. Yep, yep. No, it's exciting. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing that come full circle. Duan, I really appreciate the time <laughs> to connect on here. This is a fun conversation. I've really, I, I've enjoyed this a lot, and I know you've added a lot of value here to the audience. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for watching, you and bet. thank you hey, for having me on. You're, you're, and you're, happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. I'm Neil Timmons here uh, reminding you that real estate requires real grit. And see you next time. What if I told you you can make 20 times the return of a single family fix and flip on your next big deal? Well, it's actually possible. It's possible inside the world of commercial real estate. Say, I'm inviting you to this free challenge. It starts August 15th. It's totally free. It's a five-day challenge where I'm going to take you and deep dive into the world of commercial real estate, more specifically capital multiplier properties, what that is, how we identify them. I'm going to show you how to identify them, how to evaluate them, and how to lock them up risk-free. I'm going to give you all the paperwork to do it. It's totally free. You can sign up to join us at www.20xprofitchallenge.com forward slash real grit. That's www.20xprofitchallenge.com forward slash real grit. And I'll see you in the channel. If you like our content and want more, you can access it at realgritpodcast.com. You hear it guest after guest. Instinctively, you already know it. But let me call it out. The most expensive action is inaction. The real estate market is full of opportunities. You just need to uncover them. You can build a business that lasts for years, makes monumental impact in the lives of those that you love. It's not just about business, but about the freedom you get because of it. Have you ever heard the saying, if you want to go fast, go alone? If you want to go far, go together. I believe that partnering is essential. In fact, I partner with hardworking investors all the time. The point is that you can get a lot further with the right partner. Let me say it again, the right partner. If you've ever thought about partnering with anyone, or if you have a partner now, I encourage you to download my free Partner and Profit Guide, which includes the top five must answer questions to evaluate a profitable partnership. You can find it at www.legacyimpactpartners.com. I'll see you in the next episode.